this private vendetta of yours could easily compromise Her Majesty's government. Senor Sanchez, I could be very useful to a man in your position. You're sound, and you're dead. Would you get me a medium dry vodka martini? What a shaker. Not stirred. Effective immediately. Your license to kill is revoked. In 1989 saw the release of the 16th Bond film, Licence to Kill, and Timothy Dalton's final appearance as James Bond. With an estimated budget of around $32 million and made around $156 million worldwide, it generally received a positive reception with much praise for the stunts but some criticism on Dalton's interpretation of Bond and the fact that the film was considerably darker and more violent than its predecessors. It was the first Bond feature to receive a 15 rating in the UK and had 36 seconds cut. The short cuts they made were put back into the DVD release in 2006. The US version was also trimmed to make the PG-13 rating. If it didn't, it would have received an R rating. The US cinema returns were around 34 million, making Licence to Kill the least financially successful James Bond film in the USA, when accounting for inflation. It may have been down to the rating at the time, but many felt it had too much competition that summer. It had to compete with Batman, Back to the Future Part 2, Honey I Shrunk the Kids, Lethal Weapon 2, and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Generally, most Bond films are released in the winter, but also the title of the film was originally License Revoked, but MGM at the last minute changed the title to License to Kill, which I do feel sounds a lot better. With the sudden changes, the marketing had to be changed quickly, resulting in some awful posters. The majority of the Bond films had beautiful artwork, usually designed by Bob Peake, but they ended up with these copy and pasted photos slapped together and it felt rather cheap and didn't feel like a typical Bond poster. Shortly after The Living Daylights was released, producer Albert R. Broccoli and writers Michael Wilson and Richard Maybaum started discussing the follow-up. The film would retain a realistic style as well as showing the darker edge of the Bond character, which director John Glenn and Dalton were always pushing for. For the primary location, the producers wanted a place where the series had not yet visited. While China was visited, the idea fell through partly because of the 1987 film, The Last Emperor, which had removed some of the novelty from filming in China. By this stage, the writers had already talked about a chase sequence along the Great Wall of China. Michael Wilson also wrote two plot outlines about a drug lord in the Golden Triangle. Before the plans fell through, the writers eventually decided on settling in a tropical country where Broccoli negotiated to film in Mexico. The associated rising costs to EM Productions meant no part of License to Kill was filmed in the UK, the first Bond film not to do so. The story starts with Bond and his friend Felix Leiter, who is now a DEA agent. Felix is on his way to get married, but is quickly snapped up by other DEA agents to apprehend drug lord Sanchez. Bond is only allowed to observe, but gets involved in capturing Sanchez by attaching a hook and cord to the drug lord's plane as he attempts to escape. Bond and Felix parachute down to the wedding just in time, but they aren't aware that another DEA agent has been bribed by Sanchez and allows him to escape. Sanchez takes revenge and tortures Leiter. Bond discovers them and decides he wants to avenge his friend. M informs Bond he must leave to Turkey for a new mission, but Bond refuses and resigns, but M says he can't and has his license revoked. Bond escapes and becomes a rogue agent. He enlists the help of an ex-CIA agent to assist him in tracking down Sanchez. Bond plans to pose as an assassin and to try and gain Sanchez's trust. Bond discovers that Sanchez is more concerned about loyalty, and Bond uses this to his advantage, and begins to frame Sanchez's fellow working partners and leading Sanchez to distrust everyone instead of Bond. The casting in the film is great. Sanchez is played perfectly by Robert Darby, who comes across as very intimidating and is not concerned about money, even though he is an extremely wealthy character in the film, but is more concerned about loyalty, which becomes a key plot point to the story. Benicio Del Toro in one of his early roles, and also the youngest actor to play a villain in the series. He comes across as a complete psycho. The Bond girls are easily some of the hottest in the series. Bond, as usual, gets sexually involved with both of them. 
Continuity has never been a strong point in the series. The actor playing Felix Leiter played the same character in Live and Let Die 16 years earlier. The character of Felix has appeared in many Bond films and always by a different actor, which was so strange they could have used the same actor and have a great strong reoccurring character. The movie also highlights Bond's previous marriage from Her Majesty's Secret Service. The musical score to License to Kill was composed by Michael Kamen. John Barry was originally attached but had to decline due to throat surgery and was replaced by Kamen. Michael Kamen provides a very dark and brooding score that works on the action and emotional scenes in the film, but it doesn't blend well to the James Bond theme. When a classic theme tune appears it seems out of place and feels like it's just been copied and pasted in. I love the gun barrel music, it sets the tone of the movie immediately. Gladys Knight provides the title song. She was a devout Christian and wasn't too happy with the lyrics. The producer changed a few words so she would feel comfortable singing them. The song is definitely popular among moviegoers and it has that Bond sound to it and I think borrows a few cues from Goldfinger. Joe Mark, who had produced the Living Daylights game, acknowledged the criticism they received and made improvements for the follow-up. It follows the movie quite closely and the graphics weren't too bad, and it got favourable reviews at the time, and was released across a number of platforms, from the Spectrum to the PC, but many claimed the game was far too easy. The special effects in the movie mainly rely on stunts, with the movie going for a more grittier and realistic tone it keeps things grounded in reality. The explosions in the film are incredible, some of the largest I've seen on film. It really competes with other action movies at the time. Dalton really goes all out on the stunts, jumping on the truck and being very physical in all the action scenes. You really believe he's doing many of the shots. There was a stunt double of course for many scenes but you kind of believe it's Dalton doing those stunts, unlike many action scenes with Roger Moore. Siskel and Ebert were split on their opinions on License to Kill, but both agreed Dalton was very good in the film. Our first film is the latest James Bond adventure, and my basic reaction is that the picture is uneven, ranging from quite exciting to tedious. With Roger Moore now thankfully out of the picture, Timothy Dalton returns as 007, and the result is a more traditional character, less the wise guy, more the gutsy hard worker, and I like that difference. Bond's mission in the movie, License to Kill, is to stop a Central American drug dealer. Ignoring his government's demand that he butt out of the hunt for this drug kingpin, Bond worms his way into the crime boss's lair, posing as a problem solver for hire. Naturally, License to Kill has plenty of action scenes. The best involves Bond trying to hook the drug dealer's airplane as sort of an airborne fisherman. That's kind of fun. Some of the other action scenes run on too long, as does the whole movie. If we get the point, they should move this thing quicker to its conclusion. The film also has sort of a dirty, unfinished look that I can't explain. They spend so much money on these pictures, I can't understand why this isn't just more crisp and good looking. But Timothy Dalton is solid as Bond. Robert Davi is a good villain, although the villain itself, the character as written, isn't that uh, powerful. He doesn't seem like a classic Bond villain who's going to take over the world. There isn't a lot of romance there. Uh, he just looks like another drug dealer. I have to give the film, therefore, a mixed review. I can't recommend it enthusiastically, sort of reluctantly. It's a real close call for me. I give it thumbs down. Thumbs up for me. I liked it, I guess, a lot more than you did. And one of the things I noticed was that they are trying, at last, to make the Bond pictures a little more contemporary in feeling. Uh, That's the I'm Dalton not sure part. That, yes, I'm not sure that I was happy that the villain this time is a quasi-realistic South American drug kingpin. I liked That's, it better yes. when we had the gold fingers, you know, exactly. who were going to take over the entire world. Yes. I don't like, I, I, I'm getting tired of drugs as a subject I, uh, I am of, right there. of movies and an excuse for evil in movies. But apart from that, I think the Dalton character this time, Timothy Dalton's performance, has really found its stride. I think he is, has turned out to be a very good choice for James Bond. I think so. He's more matter of fact. He's a little harder, a little tougher, a little leaner. Uh, less obsessed with sex, more involved in action. It's more of a, of, a, of a performance that seems to realize that we've now had all the Rambo pictures, the Indiana Jones pictures, action pictures that have come along since James Bond and that were, were uh, threatening, I think, to make the whole series seem sort of obsolete. Did you think 
when I, you were sort of nodding, I, I could see out of the corner of my eye when I was talking about the dirty look of the film. Didn't that surprise you? I don't know what, uh, I don't know what's wrong there. There were a couple of, of missing shots, missing transitions, uh, feelings that we got from one place to another place without it being explained. But I'm talking As about art direction. I mean, really... Well, that didn't bother me. One thing I liked in terms of art direction and stunt coordination was the final chasing involving those three gigantic gasoline tankers down that twisting mountain road. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is as sensational a chase sequence as we've seen in any Bond picture. So I, I like that. It's not a bad picture. Even this conversation, though, reflects the mixed nature or mixed reaction I had to the picture. License to Kill has definitely become more popular over time, generally through word of mouth. Before the Daniel Craig films, the Dalton ones were the serious Bond films. The subject matter of drugs was new to Bond, but for many moviegoers, it was a subject that by 1989 had already been done to death. Scarface did that back in 1983, Lethal Weapon in 87, and Miami Vice was extremely popular on TV at the time. But the main focus of License to Kill was not the issue in regards to drug smuggling, it's more about revenge and loyalty. With most Bond movies he's given his mission and goes to complete it, but in this he goes against his superior's orders and goes out to revenge his friend. Which many hardcore fans loved, it didn't stick to the Bond formula. Timothy Dalton, I feel, stays extremely faithful to the character of Bond, and it's all down to one's interpretation. If you've read the books, you may feel Bond is slightly different. It varies from person to person. But the people involved in the series, even Desmond Llewellyn, who played Q, had said Dalton was the closest to the character, and always loved working with him. Fans also highlighted in regards to the Q character, he does feel slightly out of character. Q, in all the Bond films, was always short-tempered with Bond, but in this he feels more like a friend, which I thought was great, and it's only in License to Kill where the character Q is more developed. In comparison to The Living Daylights, I feel the previous Dalton movie has a better beginning. I still feel the first 45 minutes are perfect, but I think once Bond has his license revoked in License to Kill, then I feel the momentum of the picture improves, and the story as well. It's definitely a more interesting storyline in comparing it with Living Daylights. There's more at stake, and you feel more connected with Bond because of his loss. There are a couple of silly moments which fit perfectly in the Bond series, but seem out of place in this film. You've got Bond making his truck do a wheelie and then go on its side to narrowly avoid a rocket, and also some ninjas Bond battles as he attempts to assassinate Sanchez. But you can forgive all that because the action is incredible and well staged. This was also the last Bond film to see James actually smoke a cigarette. The film has a warning at the end commenting on the effects of smoking. Plus you see him use a laser disc player. Now that's awesome. To sum this film up, it's a serious take on the Bond character. It's not for children, it's for adults, in which the original novels were aimed at. It's a huge shame Dalton didn't do more, but what we got was something very faithful to the character we all know and love. I also think he looks in better shape in this film than he did in The Living Daylights, which I feel he looked a bit tired throughout. We also have to thank the director John Glenn, who really pushed for a more serious direction with the character. John Glenn even admitted saying this was the best film he directed. Could License to Kill be considered to be in the top 5 best Bond films? I think so. It certainly delivers on what James Bond fans expect Bond to act and look like. He drinks, he smokes and loses his temper frequently, but is able to charm any woman he encounters. To me, I've enjoyed watching all the actors portray Bond. They all have their pros and cons. But for me, Timothy Dalton is James Bond. Make a move on you In the blink of an eye